All right. Um, welcome everybody to today's webinar. We're just going to wait another minute or so just for anyone that's running slightly behind to show up. Okay. Um, look, just before we start, um, I'm sure throughout the presentation today, you might have a couple of questions. Uh, if you look towards the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A feature where you'll be able to ask those questions. Um, you'll also be getting sent a recording of today's presentation, just in case you're unable to stick around for the entirety of the session. All right. So. Your presenters today, as you've probably already guessed, my name's Mark Stewart, uh, and I'm a business development manager here at Citation HR. My role within the business is mainly based around introducing people to our brand and starting to uncover any gaps there may be within the HR processes. And then we have Brigida. So she's one of our senior workplace relations consultants here at Citation HR. She loves helping clients and businesses achieve excellent workplace compliance by way of interpretation of relevant employment legislation and awards. She particularly enjoys researching and explaining new or hot topics in the workplace in workplace relations to our clients. So we'll just start off with a bit of a group overview. Um, some of you may have attended our webinars in the past and by now, you'll see that we're actually no longer HR Assured. We've rebranded to Citation HR. So Citation HR is part of the Citation Group. For over 30 years, we've been working with Aussie and Kiwi businesses, helping them to achieve their workplace compliance objectives for a better tomorrow. From things like designing and implementing enterprise agreements or certifying ISO management systems to providing outsourced HR solutions to complex employment-related claims. Think of us as an extension of your HR team or your business pit crew. So we're basically a team of experts that are always at the ready and dedicated to getting your business where it needs to be. So just a little bit about Citation HR. Uh, I'll give you a brief rundown of what it is that we do here and the benefits of using our service. Essentially, Citation HR is your external HR partner for your business. We understand that you don't want to be spending too much time ensuring that you're meeting legislative requirements. Ideally, you're spending that time growing the business, so that's where we step in. How we do this for you is that when somebody comes on board with us, we perform a comprehensive HR compliance audit. This will help us diagnose any gaps there may be within your HR documentation and processes, and we'll then work with you to fill those gaps and ensure that you're meeting your HR obligations. You'll also have access to our 24-7 uh, telephone advisory service. So any minute of the day, you'll have a qualified professional on the other end of the phone ready to provide advice on your HR query. You'll also get access to the Citation HR cloud-based platform. So this is an online platform to manage, track, and record employee data and to streamline processes such as onboarding and offboarding of employees. It also contains a library of legal resources, uh, which is constantly updated to ensure you're up to date with current legislation. And finally, what's included with all of this is our advice promise. So what that means is if you receive an employment related claim, Citation Legal will represent you for no additional fees and Citation HR will pay for the damages and other costs associated with the defense of that claim. And today's agenda. So we'll be kicking things off with um, survey results. I'll go over that in just a moment. Uh, we'll be looking at an overview of legal frameworks, different employment contract types and employee entitlements, the common clauses found inside employment contracts, and then we'll be answering some of your questions, uh, time permitting. Right, so in some of the comms that went out prior to today's webinar, we gave you the option of completing a brief survey. So 
Um, thank you to those of you that were able to do that. And we can now re uh, reveal the results from that survey uh, before we kick off the presentation. Perfect. So question one, true or false, you can put a different notice of termination period in for employees and employers. Brigida. So this one is actually true. Um, essentially, you can have two different notice periods for the employer compared to the employee. But what it's important for businesses to keep in mind is that if an employee is given a contract and they have a much shorter notice period to be given compared to a longer one that they have to provide, they're probably not going to react very well to that and it may not be a positive experience in their onboarding. Um, but keeping in mind, whatever notice periods you do put in, they do need to be compliant with any minimum notice periods anyway, um, which we'll go into <laughs> into more detail later. Perfect. Thank you. Question number two, true or false, Australian businesses are legally required to issue written employment contracts to employees. This one is actually false. Um, so contracts are definitely, definitely best practice. It's a really big help um, for all areas of your people management in your business. If you don't have a written contract in place, it does lead to an increase in disputes being made because your terms and conditions that have been agreed on aren't in writing. So without anything to refer to, um, you have to rely on any verbal agreement, which you know, leads can lead to a he said, she said situation and just makes the whole process more complicated when you're dealing with a claim. Perfect. Question number three, an employment contract can be changed. That one is true. So you can change a contract, um, usually by way of a simple contract variation letter that sets out what's actually changing, when that will come into effect. However, it's worth noting that the employee does have to agree to this. So as an employer, you can't unilaterally change someone's contract. Any changes do have to be with their agreement. Awesome. And then finally, question number four, employees are allowed to discuss their own pay. This one is a tricky one because this is a, a bit of a recent change and is now true. So the pay secrecy clauses that we have previously seen a lot in contracts, um, which are clauses that prohibit employees from discussing their own remuneration, are now actually prohibited under the Fair Work Legislation Amendment, the Secure Jobs Better Pay Act 2022. So if you do have it in current contracts, it's important to make sure you're not enforcing it. And for any new contracts, you just can't include those types of clauses. Perfect. All right. Now, just following on from that, um, we have one more slide before I'll pass over to, to Brigida. So um, we'd actually like to extend an offer of a complimentary workplace compliance consultation uh, to the first 20 businesses that register their interest today. So what that'll do is it'll help uncover any hidden risks uh, and threats to your company. Uh, it will navigate and understand if your business is compliant with the latest law changes avoid severe penalties and consequences for non-compliance. Um, and also it'll help educate yourself uh, on current workplace rules, legislation and compliance. And then finally, just to help protect you, your business and your people. So hopefully most of you will know how these nifty little QR code things work by now. I believe the last few years, many people got much more uh, across the board with those. All you need to do is scan it on your smartphone and follow the prompts, or you can visit the link below the code. So just one more time as well, um, if you have any questions throughout the session, please feel free to use the Q&A function below. That's it from me for now. Uh, Brigitte, over to you. Thanks, Mark. Okay, so we're going to jump straight into it and set the scene a bit with an overview of the legal frameworks and where all these rules or guidelines are coming from. So our legislative framework is currently these different interacting and overlapping parts. We've got the most well-known one in the employment relations landscape, which is the Fair Work Act 2009, and that includes the National Employment Standards or NES. 
We have federal and state legislation on equal employment opportunity and discrimination. We have the many industry and occupational modern awards. And lastly, we have federal and state workplace health and safety laws. Looking now just specifically at the national employment standards. So these are contained in part 2.1 of the Fair Work Act. So they cover off on a lot of different entitlements, but we'll just briefly touch on the ones that should be mentioned in your employment contracts. So we've got annual leave, personal carers leave, which is often referred to as sick leave. Uh, we've got compassionate leave, community service leave, family domestic violence leave, notice of termination, public holidays and parental leave. We'll move right on onto some more contract specific matters. So let's have a look at the different contract types you can have in your business. For engagement structures, generally, there are two types of engagement structures you can use for your workers. So these are employment and contract for services. In an employment relationship, we can have permanent employment, which includes full-time and part-time employment, casual employment, and then fixed term and maximum term employment. In a contract for services relationship, we typically have independent contractor arrangements and services and facilities arrangements. So we'll just dig into just the employment types a bit deeper. So full-time and part-time employment or permanent employment. So while full-time and part-time employees do come within the same permanent category, there are some notable differences between the two. So with your full-time employees, they work an average of 38 hours per week. They accrue four weeks of annual leave annually, with the exception of some awards providing for five weeks of annual leave for shift workers. They have 10 days of personal carers leave accruing each year. That's a sick leave we talked about. Um, whereas your part-time employees are contracted to work less than 38 hours a week on a regular and predictable basis. If they are award covered, most awards will set restrictions on part-time patterns of work. So it is really important to be checking your applicable award for any limitations or rules around contracted hours for part-time employees before you are creating and issuing their contract of employment. Part-time Part-time employees accrue annual leave and a personal leave on a pro rata basis according to their hours, but all permanent employees get the same minimum notice period for termination, which we'll touch on a little bit later. Looking now at casual employment, this is um, uh, understandably a very popular type of engagement for a lot of different industries. And the nature of casual employment is that casuals are engaged on an as needed basis and there is no firm advanced commitment to ongoing work and they're not guaranteed work or shifts. So they really shouldn't have an agreed or fixed pattern of work and their hours should typically vary from week to week. Casuals don't accrue or receive annual leave, personal leave, or any kind of paid leave except for family and domestic violence leave, and they're not entitled to redundancy pay. Um, and lastly, they aren't required to give or entitled to receive notice of termination. So look, this might seem like a pretty raw deal for employees who are offered casual positions, but to compensate for all of this, they do receive a 25% casual loading on top of any minimum permanent rate of pay. So even though casual employment can tend to be a bit on the fly sometimes or ad hoc, it's still really important and recommended that casual employees are given proper casual employment contracts. Uh, and Citation HR does have contract templates specifically for casual employees to make sure that you as an employer are protected and also that the terms and conditions for the employee are compliant as well. We're jumping backwards a little bit now with our fixed term and maximum term contracts, which can be used for your permanent employees, either full-time or part-time. So these contracts are set apart because they are engagements only for a specific set period of time, for example, 12 months. What that means is that at the end of the specified term, the contract and the employment relationship automatically end without the need for termination or resignation. 
these types of contracts can be used for um, matters like uh, roles that have been created based off a limited period of funding, a role to cover someone's parental leave or other similar situations. Fixed term contracts typically restrict the employer from ending the contract before the expiration of the term. So these ones should be used with a bit of caution. Maximum term contracts are a bit more of a flexible option and they allow parties to terminate the agreement prior to the end of the term. It is important to note before we move on that as of December 2023, there are now limitations in force on fixed and maximum term contracts, which restrict how long the term can be and how many times you can renew them. I won't go into detail today because that is a whole other webinar in of itself, but feel free to check out our other resources on this topic if it's something that's relevant for your business. We'll now have a look at some common clauses in employment contracts. So while there are a lot of different clauses that we typically see in a contract of employment, we're just going to have a look at some of the most common ones that we do find in employment contracts. So we'll start off with every employer's favourite, which is probationary periods. Now they should only be used for new employees to the business. And essentially what it is, is a short period of time where employees are aware that their employer will be reviewing their initial performance to assess if they're a good fit in the role and with the company. Most, most often we would see periods of three months or six months for a probation, but it is up to the employer to set this. The general rule is that it should be a reasonable period for the role, taking into account the minimum employment period or MEP. Let's just stop for a minute and talk about what MEP means. So MEP, or as I said, minimum employment period, is a period in which a new employee is not protected from unfair dismissal. The MEP of an employee will be six months unless they're part of a small business with less than 15 employees, in which case it would be 12 months. This ties into our next point on probation, which is that having a probationary period does not provide the business with any extra protection from an unfair dismissal or a general protections claim. So the point of probation is to reflect or align with the employee's actual MEP and also put the employee on notice that their performance is being monitored closely and needs to meet the needs of the company. Permanent employees in probation will still accrue leave as per usual, and they're still entitled to the minimum notice of termination as well. Moving on to a clause that you might like a little bit less, but needs to be in there anyway, is the remuneration clause. So just noting that an employee's remuneration must meet their minimum entitlements under the Fair Work Act or applicable industrial instrument, such as a modern award or enterprise agreement. This clause sets out what the employee will be receiving, including whether they're getting paid an hourly wage or an annual salary, and whether penalties and other entitlements are being paid in addition to their rate or are included within it. For casuals, this clause should reflect that the employee is receiving a 25% casual loading to compensate for not having leave entitlements. It should also stipulate the method of payment, which is typically via EFT and refer to the frequency of payment, whether that's weekly, fortnightly or monthly. Next, we have notice of termination or resignation. Um, as a reminder, this only implies to permanent employees. So casual employees are not entitled to receive or required to give notice of termination notice of resignation or notice of termination. The minimum statutory notice periods are set out in this table and they are one week for less than one year of service, two weeks for one to three years of service, three weeks for three to five years of service and four weeks for five or more years of service. So the notice period is based on your um, employee's years of service. It is worth noting here that most awards also set out that if your employee has had over two years of continuous service and is over the age of 45, they are required to be provided with an additional week of notice to whatever their minimum is. This doesn't apply to the employee when resigning who only needs to provide the minimum. It's just for employer's notice. 
You can put a longer period than the minimum statutory notice in your contracts, but it cannot ever be less than the minimum. So as we touched on at the start with the survey questions, we can't have, say, one day's notice required of the employer and four weeks of the employee. It needs to at least meet the minimum. Last of all, we've got post-employment restraints. These can be complicated and difficult to understand for both employers and employees. In most cases, I would say that these are typically used more as a preventative measure, but if they are breached by an employee, they can be enforced through the court system. Um, importantly, post-employment restraints must be reasonable to be enforceable. So it means that they must protect some legitimate interests of the business. So anything that is unreasonable is unlikely to be enforceable. We can narrow post-employment restraints down into three categories. First is non-poaching. So this type of clause restricts employees from poaching or encouraging other employees or contractors of their employer to leave the company and or join them in a different business. The second type of, of restraint clause is non-solicitation. This clause is similar to non-poaching, but it restricts employees from soliciting clients or customers away from the company after their employment comes to an end. Um, this is one that we could see in a casual contract as opposed to some other ones which are less reasonable for casual employees. The third category of restraints are non-competition or non-compete restraints. So these clauses restrict employees from working for a competitor in a specific area for a specific time frame after their employment ends. As I said, post-employment restraints can be hard to understand um, and difficult to explain to employees who usually will have questions around what it is, how it applies, what it means. So if you do have questions come up or you're needing assistance with this type of matter, I would always recommend reaching out to a consultant like the team at Citation HR or a lawyer to go through these with you. That does bring us to the end of our brief dive into employment contracts. And there is so much more that can be said on this topic and many other considerations that are important to be across. So I would encourage you to reach out and book a consultation with our team using the QR code on the screen. Thanks, Mark. Perfect. Thank you very much, Brigida, for that. Um, yeah, we'll leave the QR code up on the screen for a wee while longer just to give everybody a chance to give it a scan. Um, I believe there should still hopefully be some spots available. And then following on from that, we'll go through some of your questions. So about another 20 seconds, we'll leave that up there for you. All right, so um, we'll go through some questions. Why not? So just before we do that, I would like to thank you all for joining us today. Um, Brigida, you've provided some really valuable content to us in this session. Thank you once again. I'm sure I'm not the only one here walking away with a little bit more clarity around some employment related, uh, contract related topics. With that said, there were some questions that came through um, and if you don't mind hanging around to answer a few of those, it would be greatly appreciated. So first one being, and to put you on the spot, what's the difference between an SFA and an independent contractor agreement? Okay, great question, um, because we didn't really deal too much with the contractor side of things today, because this was a webinar about employment contracts. So um, an independent contractor agreement or an ICA is where typically where you're engaging a contractor, so not an employee, to perform services for your company, either on an ongoing basis for a specific task or for a specific period. So that's different from an SFA where um, a services and facilities agreement is often where a contractor will essentially 
pay you as the business to conduct their own business on your premises. So you'll that often looks like the company providing equipment and assisting staff like reception staff to the contractor to assist them in carrying out their business. Um, this is commonly seen in industries like the medical industry or dental industry um, as a very typical arrangement. Great. All right. Uh, the next question, can you put restraints in a casual employment contract? Um, technically, yes. But what it's going to come down to is what what is reasonable so it's usually not going to be reasonable to have these types of restraints for casual employees just due to the nature of their employment you know they're not guaranteed work so it's it may not be reasonable to restrict them from going out and getting other work um you the exception to this i would say is um you could look at including non-solicitation clauses in if it's reasonable again and relevant to your specific industry so if you've got casuals that are dealing one-on-one -on -one with clients as in the nature of their role you might want to consider if it's going to be reasonable to put a non-solicitation clause in their casual contract all the other restraints especially restraints of trade i would say it's usually not going to be reasonable to include those uh this popped up briefly actually something that you covered uh, a little bit earlier. Does Citation HR have templates for employment contracts? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as part of signing up with Citation HR, you have access to a full suite of templates. So permanent, full-time, part-time, casual, maximum term, independent contractor agreements, um, and so on. We have standard templates available that you can create through our cloud system, but we also will assist you with tailoring specific contracts to your individual business needs. Perfect, nicely done. We've probably got time for one more. Um, I have an employee moving on to a new role. Do I have to issue a new employment contract? Yeah, look, great question. This one will probably come down to the specific situation and should be looked at on case by case basis. So if we are changing something very minor, um, as I said, like, let's just say they're just getting a pay increase, um, then we can do a contract variation, as I mentioned earlier. But if their um, position title is changing along with their pay or any other kind of significant condition is changing, then it's definitely best practice to issue a brand new contract, which reflects their original commencement date with the company, but also reflects the date that this new arrangement will come into place. This is really important if you've got someone moving from a casual uh, from casual employment into permanent employment, they really need a new permanent contract that reflects the um, nature and current terms and conditions of their new employment relationship. Right, perfect. Well, thank you very much um, for answering those just now. That brings us to the end of today's webinar. Um, look, whether that was your first time joining us or you've attended one of our webinars in the past, we hope you've found value in coming along today. And if you have any further questions or you'd like to learn more about what it is that we do, please don't hesitate to contact us using the details on your screen right now. I hope to speak to some of you soon and thank you very much.